life expectancy has dropped to 40. Before the, uh, the, 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 the coming of oil, we had good fishes, good uh, rich estuaries, um, good coastal land. We had no pipe-borne water, but we had fresh water that was floating, uh, unpolluted, that our parents and our grandparents had. And they were healthy. They were just living and they were getting by. And then this thing called oil came. In the Niger Delta, we have been colonized by the Nigerian elite, by the corporations. Their strategy is to get the whole of the people in the Niger Delta removed so that the oil companies can have a free hand in taking this oil without any form of resistance. But that is not going to be possible because our people, these are our ancestral homes, we will prefer to die on this land of our ancestors that surrender it because of oil and gas, which is a very temporary resource. In 20 to 30 years or thereabout, there will be no more oil. The land will be left devastated. The water is polluted. The people angry, hungry, because there will be no land where they can fish and farm. An excerpt of Sandy Siafi's film called Sweet Crude, as we turn now to another clip from her film. It's about what's going on in the Niger Delta. It feels to me like it's stuck and yet it's at a tipping point. And it could be really a disaster, uh, depending on which way it tips. I think it's going to take something pretty dramatic, actually. And it could be dramatic in the sense of being a tragedy. Or it could be an individual or collective act of extraordinary bravery and courage and innovation. Either of those could happen. So we're looking like we're looking like a time bomb. A time bomb. And when it blows, it's gonna blow us all the way. Everybody will be involved. Today we have a very delicate situation. A situation that is waiting to explode any time in the Delta. Even if you move in the military to wipe out those young men who are carrying guns. I can rest assured the world that maybe the children that are going to be born today will carry guns tomorrow. There's a limit to the amount of beating the human body and spirit, you know, and resilience can take before, uh, you know, it turns into resistance and that's what has happened, you know. This is what they planted, and now they're ripping it. There's two things that can happen. We all get together and look for peace, non-violently. Or the world sits by and watch. They think it's an Nigerian problem. Nobody wants war. This is the time that the world should get together for peace. Excerpts of Sandy Siafi's film, Sweet Crude as we go back for final comment to Denzo Imagbe Kentebe. What do you think needs to happen right now? Denzo uh, Kentebe is chair of the Ijaw National Congress, Lagos chapter, speaking to us from Nigeria. Needs to allow international humanitarian uh, organizations to come into this region to at least take care of the wounded, uh, take care of the dead, and uh, take care of our children, and begin a uh, process of developing this, uh, this, these areas so the people who have been displaced can go right back to their homes. We call on the youth who have been carrying arms, which we do not support, by the way. The International Congress does not support uh, armed struggle. We have always believed in dialogue, and we have been dialoguing with the Nigerian government uh, till date. So we call on all those carrying arms, both the military and the youth that are agitating, to drop their arms for the sake of peace. That's my last comment. We're going to turn now to Sandy Siafi. Uh, Sandy Siafi is joining us from Seattle, Washington, director of the film Sweet Crude. Um, on Wednesday, as we were saying, the village of Aparosa, where much of Sweet Crude was filmed, was burned down. Sandy, the latest news you have from the area and why you focused in Sweet Crude, of course, before this latest attack on that area. Well, I focused uh, in the area that I did because the Baramatu Kingdom is typical of the Niger Delta, which is to say that, uh, like the conditions you heard earlier, the people there really have no uh, 
drinking water, hospitals, et cetera, though billions of dollars come out of the ground. But most importantly, because this moment, as, as you heard, is such a tipping point. And I don't think there could be a, a more tragic piece of news than to hear that in, instead of preventive diplomacy, that now the Nigerian military has decided to actually go ahead and, and open fire in the way that they have. Uh, and Sandy, as we were speaking to Denzel Amagbe Kentebi, he's telling us about the what's happening there now. When you were filming, uh, what kind of interaction or or did you have with the Nigerian government, and, and what kind of restrictions did they place, if any, on you and your filming? Oh well, they actually detained me in military prison at one point, so that was very restrictive. Um, it, it is not a government that is very friendly to journalists, to say the least. They've actually been named by Reporters Without Borders, one of the uh, press freedom criminals. Um, and the Nigerian government, uh, as you may know, is really a newly democratic uh, government. It has been a military dictatorship for years, and that legacy continues. It's largely speaking, the Niger Delta, that is, an occupied land. And I think what's very disappointing right now is that there were steps. There was a, a report called a technical committee report. And although that sounds quite dry, understand that from the perspective of the international community and some very strong leadership, I want to say, by Senator Ross Feingold on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, there was actually a move toward pushing, especially as we entered a new State Department and new administration here, pushing the Nigerian government toward demilitarizing the Delta, toward amnesty for militants, toward third-party mediation. So what the Nigerian government is currently engaged in is flouting completely what my understanding is of both the Obama administration's position on Nigeria, as well as what was an understanding with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Sandy, I want to ask you about the militant leader known as Tampolo. According to many press reports, he's one of the targets of the current offensive by the Nigerian military as a leader of men to the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta. He's been accused of carrying out kidnappings and attacks. You interviewed Tampolo on the condition you didn't film his face. I just want to play a part of what he said. This is from your documentary, Sweet Crude. We are not in this for money, for our own personal self. We are a people invested in a cause. And that cause is to liberate our people from abject poverty and deprivation in the midst of plenty. We are not violent people. We did not start the struggle with arms and guns. It is not part of our philosophy to use guns and weapons. But the multinational corporations of Shell and Chevron, with the collaboration of the federal government, have given the struggle arms. They introduce guns into our radius. Anytime we rise up to make demands, they send the Nigerian military to suppress us, to kill our people. And of course you will agree with me, you cannot sit down and fold your hands and watch your people be killed and destroyed. Sandy Siafi, director of new film Sweet Crude, speaking to us from Seattle. Tom Polo, tell us about him. Well, Tom Polo has long been considered one of the leaders of a more political aspect of the movement. As you can understand, in an area where you have the amount of money and the amount of corruption that you do stemming mostly from the Nigerian government in collusion with oil companies, and this is decades old, you actually have had companies that have armed young groups against each other in their interests in keeping control over the Niger Delta. And as one might expect, there has been resistance. And in that resistance, there have been several leaders along the way. Tampolo is a leader in an area called Delta State. Now, it's certainly not, not mine to judge whether the choice to be in, involved in an armed resistance is the correct choice. When I asked him about Nelson Mandela, he said that he hoped that a move toward a political struggle could really occur, um, but that at the time, the feeling was that without arms, that the people of the Niger Delta were laid to bear uh, against the Nigerian military. I think that Tampolo's position at the time that I think remained the case was the request that the international community intervene so that a ceasefire was something that would be trustworthy. I think to simply request that the militants no longer use guns when the Nigerian military is occupying their villages was considered unreasonable. In in April 2006, militants from the Niger Delta kidnapped six foreign oil workers and held them for two weeks. One of the oil workers kidnapped, Mason Hawkins, was a contractor for Shell. He appears in the documentary Sweet Crude. 
they wanted us to, you know, look at uh, the, these little villages. They all had dirt floors, and there was no schools. It was a pitiful life that they lived. I didn't like being a, a captive, but then looking back on it, I think those people did what they thought they had to do to try to get, uh, you know, something out of uh, all of that billions of dollars. And uh, I can't, uh, I can't hold it against them. They want their fair share, and they they'll tell you right quick what they want. And it's not unreasonable. Mason Hawkins, uh, final comments.